Thank you, David. Thank you for that. Good morning, everybody. It is good to see you here. It is good to be together. You, you look great out there. I want to say a special word of welcome uh, to our guest today. If you are a guest with us, we're glad that you are here. And if you're here for the first time or if you've not done this yet, we ask you to do us a favor. In the pew back in front of you, you will find a welcome card, a little blue card, a guest welcome card. And we ask that you give us the information that's asked for inside that card. We want to know that you're here, and we want to know how to get in touch with you. We want to make sure that you are aware of so many of the life-giving things that go on in the life of this church. So please give us that information, and you can put your completed card uh, in the offering plate when it's passed a little later, or after the service, there will be pastors here in the front. Bring your card down. We'd like to we'd like to meet you. So if you'll do that, that will be great for right now. Welcome. We're glad that you're here. And speaking of guests, uh, I want to make sure that all of our newcomers know that next Sunday, the 13th at 9:30 in the morning, we are having a um, a guest. A newcomer welcome celebration breakfast. It's at 9:30 during the during the Sunday school hour. We'll be meeting in the heritage room, and we will have a chance to share a meal together, just to get to know each other a little better, and celebrate uh, our newcomers who have come to be with us. That could be that you've just most recently joined the church, or it could be that you've um, are here for the very first time or very new with us. It doesn't matter. Everyone is welcome. All ages are welcome. And, you know, it's a free breakfast, so that ain't half bad, right? So we invite all of our newcomers to be with us at Let's Eat next week. Um, you can make a reservation on our website, jcbc.org. So we've been talking about this a little bit, and we're going to continue to talk about it because it is important. We are in the season of deacon nomination and deacon election. And that is, you know, that is a church-wide thing. And we all need to participate in this process. So you should have received information on it by now. You, you know how to make your nominations. We want to ask that you please, please take that seriously and participate in that process. It is an important thing that we do together. So uh, today would be a good day to get that done if you haven't done it already. We've also been talking about this. There's so many things that are starting up, and today is one of those days. It's, it's finally here. This afternoon is the choir Christmas launch party at 4 o'clock uh, in the choir suite. <laughs> I feel so affirmed for having said that so well. That's this afternoon. If you have ever had any inkling or just wondering if you would like to be a part of this wonderful choir, this is a great time for you to dip into that. So today, they'll be starting uh, practicing and, and learning about the Christmas music that will be coming up in just, gosh, a few months down the road. So you are invited to that. Come and give it a try and see if you like it. I heard in Sunday school this morning, someone said that they understood that the church was just getting together to sing some Christmas carols this afternoon. <laughs> well, that's true. There will be Christmas carols. But the event is for those who might like to participate uh, in our sanctuary choir. So come and be uh, a part of that. Tonight also at 5 o'clock is the youth welcome back party out on the soccer field. So uh, if you are the parent or grandparent or just know uh, of a student, please remind them that this is the welcome back party tonight at 5 o'clock out on the soccer field. We have been talking about all the things that are happening here at the 1st of August, and there's a lot of them. So please go onto our website at jcbc.org and, um, and engage. Jump in. Dive in. Let's do this life together. Of course, all the things that we do here, that we endeavor to do together, are made possible, yes, by the grace of God. And our 
under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, but it's made possible on this earth by your generosity and by your faithful giving. So I want to encourage you to uh, continue to prayerfully and generously give to support the ministries and the mission of this church. We can do, and we do, incredible things together. That would be a good place for a cheer, too. <laughs> this is pretty fun this morning. <laughs> Lots going on, but for now, for right now, it's time for us to come to worship. Amen. To join our hearts and our minds in the worship of God as we raise our voices and as Pastor Sean begins a new sermon series today, come and see. We're glad that you're here. Thank you so much, Pastor David. I've been giving announcements to this choir for two years and they hardly ever cheer when I say something. So I want to know how you did that and learn from you. And I'll, I think that cheer from the choir was them saying amen for you to come and see what it's about today if you're interested. But for now, we're going to stand to our feet and praise God, crown him king. be a good place for an amen. amen. Now I'm telling you right now, life is worth the living because he's holding our future. But you know, it's not just our walking around future here. We've read the last chapter in the book and Jesus wins and we're with him and our future in heaven with him is going to be singing with the angels about holy, holy, holy. And forever praising him. It's going to be a joyful thing, but we get to rehearse that right now. Jessica, start us off here. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us, and all who will believe, 
will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And we'll sing. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above it all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above it all. And the angels sigh, holy, all creation cries. stand before him it makes us want to surrender everything to him give him your worship today we hold nothing back Jesus
Amen. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Lord, 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 here we are in this place. We've arrived here. We've gathered together. We come here hopeful. We come here expecting something. Some of us arrive here joyful and delighted. Some of us arrive here desperate. We come from all kinds of places with all kinds of things going on in our lives. All kinds of pain, all kinds of delight, all kinds of worry, all kinds of Uncertainty. We bring it all into this room. And Lord, in the middle of those things and the distractions of this earth, we plan and we scheme and we try and we struggle and we strategize. And some of us just roll. But Lord, today, let us do the thing that we know we should do. Surrender. We're here to surrender it all. We're going to be reminded that your body was broken for us, that your blood was shed for us, and that you do indeed stand above it all. This day, Lord, we resolve to surrender. Each of us as a human and we as a church pour down on us like rain. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Jesus loves me, this I heard. word and in my mind I truly did believe but not until I faced the cross did I see what loving me had cost it was then my heart was changed a Calvary the first time time. 
are going to be joining you just now, and we're going to have our offering time, so let's worship the Lord and just pray for this service. Well, hello. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You, my friends, are a sight for sore eyes. I have missed you. And I have worshiped with you online for the last three months. Every Sunday, I've been tuning in and worshiping in my own heart as I watch you worship here. And every week, my heart has swelled with love and gratitude and pride you're something else you know so grateful every week I watch and I'm so grateful especially for our worship leaders who you know we're uncommonly blessed here with our our music leadership and our our worship leadership who every week lead us into the throne room of grace and one of the things I became most grateful for over these last three months as I was watching is a few unsung and unseen heroes because you don't know about them unless something goes wrong. We have 
an amazing production ministry here. Yeah. Thanks be to God. Who make it possible for those who cannot be here with us to be a part of something so powerful and so special every week. And I'm just grateful to them. I'm so grateful for my pastor's council who has walked with me these past three months, day after day after day, loving me and loving you. I'm so, so grateful for our pastors. We are uncommonly blessed in this church with pastors, by the way, who I found out can preach. And my word, I realized I needed to get back to work because they were doing so well. I may not have a job when I get back. I'm so grateful for my pastors who love and lead so, so well. And if I could just say it, I'm so grateful for one of my very best friends in the world, Dr. Greg DeLoach. That's a preaching somebody, Greg is, and I'm so grateful. Yeah, thank you. I'm so grateful to Greg for loving you in these many days. Now, about two weeks ago, about 500 of us gathered together in the Family Life Center to talk a little bit about what led into my time away and to talk a little bit about what God has been doing to put together broken parts that are inside me. And we're not talking about that today for a couple of reasons, but the thing I want to say to you is this. I have been, in the last two weeks, completely gobsmacked, overwhelmed by your letters and your cards and your emails and your texts and your phone calls to express to me and to my family how much you love us. And I can tell you the one thing that makes me love you so deeply is I was reminded what a place of grace this place is. And you have reminded me that we are a grace people. And if you're here for the very first time today worshiping and you've come from a broken place or you come in here barely limping into this environment and you are aware of your emptiness and you're aware of your imperfection, I just want you to know you have stumbled into the right place because these people know how to love deeply and I'm so, so grateful. Now, we're not going to talk about all that that we talked about a couple of weeks ago because of one thing. I want to talk about somebody who is so much more compelling than me. I wonder if it'd be okay for just a little while if I talk about somebody else, about a name that is above every name. A name that at this name every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess. I wonder if we might talk about the name of the Lord today. I wonder if I might talk about the lily of the valley and the bright morning star for just a little while. Because one thing has become clearer to me these many months is just who I am and pardon the phrase, just who I ain't. And I can tell you that one thing I see with crystal clarity these days is that I am a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. That is why we are here today. And I wonder if we might just talk a little while about Christ. See, all year long, we've attempted to do that. We began this year attempting to talk about what it means to make more and deeper disciples of Jesus. And we started that conversation in January by trying to identify a problem in our country with the the church in America. And we identified the problem in a sermon series that I entitled, Losing My Religion. And we acknowledged that there were so many in our country in the church who are leaving organized religion but curiously are not leaving faith. There is still something of a divine homing beacon that has been placed in them that still drives them toward mystery and mysticism and spirituality and that which is divine. And we said in that sermon series, what if we could somehow get a clear, fresh encounter with the true risen Christ of God. I wonder if it would make a difference in the places where the church has been broken these days. So we moved into a series that we called I Am. And we talked for a while about letting Jesus 
introduce himself to us once again in all the I am statements. And we said in that series that everything that he is has the power to form and reform and inform and transform everything that you and I are. And after having talked a little while about the character of Jesus, after thinking about his essence, his personhood, and how who he is shapes who we are intended to be, we moved into another study in the Sermon on the Mount all through the summer called Walk This Way. And in that sermon series, we let Dr. Deloach and the rest of our pastors lead us up the mountain with Jesus and beyond as we explored homiletically and hermeneutically the greatest sermon that has ever been preached, the Sermon on the Mount. And we explored the ethics of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus. We considered for a little while in our minds what it means to focus on that which Jesus said we ought to focus on. And now here we are, the beginning of the fall. And we've talked about him all year long. We've thought about him all year long. We've studied his teachings. We've considered his ways. That means there is only one thing left to do. Do something about it. You see, faith is not simply an intellectual exercise. Faith does not matter unless it grows feet. Faith is not faith unless it grows feet. Faith doesn't matter unless there is a dynamic, actualized, amplified, concrete, existential concretization of faith in our everyday practical lives. You're going to have to forgive me because I'm not preached in three months. I got some things in my heart that need to get out. You should have packed a lunch. Fortunately for you, we have some bread. (laughs) You realize faith is not faith unless it grows feet. So after having thought about him all year long, talked about him, studied him all year long, now, my beloved friends, my sisters and brothers, it is time for somebody to come and see him. To come and see him. I ask that you would bow with me one more time in a word of prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, our hearts inspire and fill us with your holy fire. For if you are with us, then nothing else matters. But if you are not with us, then nothing else matters. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. I wonder if you might turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the first chapter of the Gospel of John. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. As you turn to John chapter 1, verse 35, hear these words as they comprise my assignment for this day to call our mind's attention and our heart's affection to the one who says, come and see. Chapter 1, verse 35, the next day John, that's John the Baptist, again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, He exclaimed, look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translates teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. What's interesting about this passage as it meets us this morning is that John the Baptist, you you know John the Baptist. He has these, these disciples. It begins with two disciples of John the Baptist. This 
is the very first conversation that Jesus has with his disciples according to the Gospel of John. Now, in other Gospels, there's a different rendering of his first conversations. But in John, this is his first conversation with his would-be disciples who happened to be, at the time, affiliated with John the Baptist. Now, you know John the Baptist. That kind of strange, eccentric prophet of the wilderness, kind of kind of wild, kind of unusual, camel hair outfit, leather belt, eats locusts and wild honey, you know he's just weird enough to be interesting. You know he was a preacher's kid, right? I'm not kidding. You know John the Baptist was a preacher's kid. And, you know, his father, Zechariah, was a priest, which is to say his father worked for the institution. His father worked for the organizational, institutional expression of the religious order of the day, which is another way of saying John the Baptist grew up in church. But the thing about preacher's kids, any preacher's kids in the room just going to make some noise or, or raise your hand, say amen. I see a few of you. I uh, know, okay, I share DNA with one of them right here. The thing about being a preacher's kid is you're raised in such a way as to see things through a different set of lens because sometimes you grow up seeing behind the curtain. And John the Baptist grew up seeing something that needed to change. That's why his dominant sermon everywhere he went was one word. Repent. Metanoia. Change. Something's got to change. We can't keep doing this and expect to see the kingdom if something doesn't change. You've got to change, repent, turn around. And people who were hungry, people who were hungry for something different, people who were tired, burned out on religion, tired of the system, tired of the organization, tired of all the frustrations and disillusionments of the day, well, they followed John the Baptist because maybe he has something new to say. So he's standing there with two of his disciples and he sees Jesus walks by. And so he turns, he leverages his own relationship with the two disciples and says, look, look at this one. Don't look at me. He, he's like, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. Behold, this is the Lamb of God. And they begin to follow him. And then something interesting happens as soon as Jesus notices that two are on his tail. He turns around and asks an interesting question. What are you looking for? I really don't know that there could be any more profound, poignant, transformational question to be asked in faith than what are you looking for? Everybody is looking for something sometime. The people in your family, your coworker, the one who shares a cubicle on the other side of yours, who perhaps gets on your nerves, everybody is looking for something sometime. The server who will bring you your food today at the restaurant. The person who busses your dishes away when you leave. The sanitation worker who hauls off your refuse every week. Everybody is looking for something sometime. Some of us are flanked by somebody looking for something. The person to your right, to your left. The person who is sitting right in front of you. They would not be here today. If at some deep soul level they weren't looking for something. And some of us look for healing. Some of us look for forgiveness, for grace. Some of us look for another chance. Some of us look for justice. Some of us look for change. Some of us who may have been adrift in a sea of change are looking for change to stop. And for something sure and foundational to stand upon, everybody is looking for something sometime. And it's interesting to me that this is the first conversation that he has with the first disciples in John. Because it shows me that Jesus makes the first move. 
Now, obviously they're following him, but Jesus makes the first move of any significance. He turns to them and engages them with a life-changing question. And that's important to point out because this is perhaps why the 13th century theologian Aquinas said that God is the first mover. Somebody here may be thinking that the only way you can have faith is for you to drum up some idea somehow to take initiative yourself. Somebody here may be thinking that there's no hope for redemption between you and God or you and others unless you first make the move. But I'm here to tell you, if you heard nothing else thus far, hear this. God has already made the first move. God has poured God's own love into the universe most fully revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. So it's your move. It's your move. And it's interesting to me because the ways that God will ask us that question, well, they come camouflaged sometimes. God doesn't come right out and say, what are you looking for? God at times will use the most painful Seasons of suffering and loss and grief to somehow make you look up, not as if God caused it, but to make you look up because sometimes it takes some of us knee deep in the broken fragments of all that we thought we were looking for to realize what we were really looking for. And so now we stand there in the broken fragments of all we thought we valued and realize we're still looking. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And Jesus says to you, what are you looking for? And the two disciples, they answer him. Jesus is talking about a deep existential soul level kind of search. What is it you're hungry for? What are you thirsty for? And they say, hey, so Lord, where are you staying? And, and it's, it sounds as if they're awkward and they, they don't want to answer the question. It sounds as, have you ever been asked a question so deep that you realized to go there would make you so uncomfortable you would rather stay in the ambiguity of your lostness than to be uncomfortably set free? Except in this passage, it's interesting because there is a word that's used in this, this answer when they say, where are you staying? The word in Greek has a, a, a root. The root word is meno. Meno means to abide or stay or remain. It means to stay put, to, to abide someplace for a long period of time. But when a disciple is asking a potential rabbi, where you're staying, it has a double entendre. It doesn't mean, hey, what hotel are you staying at tonight? It means, where are you camped? Where do you abide on all the major issues of this day? Where are you, minnow, where are you staying, camped out? Where do you pitch your tent on the Mosaic law, rabbi? Are you, do you interpret Moses as a liberal, as a conservative, as a moderate? Uh, tell us. What camp are you camped in? Where do you, Minno, abide? Are you a Pharisee, a Sadducee, an Essene, a Zealot? Tell us something about yourself, Rabbi. When you have been trained in your rabbinical traditions, do you more align with the school of Hillel or the school of Shammai? See, when somebody decides to follow a rabbi, they become all in. And it doesn't take a long walk for you to understand why they would be so interested in information about Jesus. Because some of us do the very same thing. Jesus says, what are you looking for? A table is spread. Here I am. What are you looking for? And yet we do the same thing. Well, does this church have the programs that I need for my kids? And, and does this preacher, what does he, does he talk about? You know, how does he preach from the Bible? And does the choir sing the kind of music I like? Or are there at least another option so I can go to a different service? And, and we ask all the questions, where are you staying, Rabbi? We ask in our own way. And you know what Jesus says? Come and see. Come and see for yourself. You know what he doesn't say? You know what Jesus doesn't do? Jesus doesn't print out a resume or hand them a business card. He doesn't share a link to the latest episode of the podcast where he talks about the latest rabbinical 
thought. He says, come and see. You know what else he doesn't do? He doesn't say, come and think about it. Come and play around. Come and watch from a distance. Come and just take your time and pray about it. No. Action. Come and see. Come and see now. It's interesting to me. This this is because true faith is not about gaining information. True faith is about experiencing true transformation. And transformation cannot come unless we are willing to take a big, fat step into risk and lose it all if we lose it all. To take a step into risk because Jesus never asked anyone to follow him without first asking them to walk away from something, to let something go, to lose something they thought meant more than anything else in the world. Matthew, get up. I know it's a vocation that you can control, but get up from that tax collecting table because I've got some, come and see. And he has to leave everything he ever knew. Peter, James, you're great fishers of men, but leave what you know and walk with me into the risk of becoming fishers of people. You can fish for fish, but I'll make you fish for people. He says to Paul, come and see. But to come and see for you, Paul, it means you're going to have to let go of the bigotry and the assumptions that you have about this group of people and their way of believing me. And he says to Thomas, I want you to come and see, Thomas, but you have to let go of something. Let go of your control of certainty and outcome and facts and information and just risk it all. What is it? that you're looking for? And what is it that God requires you to let go of in order to find? Now, listen, I just want to put one more thing out there. Then we're going to eat. You know, it's interesting to me. This is the first conversation that he has with his disciples in John's gospel. And he uses words like, minnow, stay, abide, stay put, stay with me. And they ask questions like, hey, where are you staying? But if you fast forward, they do come and see, don't they? For three years, they came and they saw. And if you were to fast forward to the last conversation that he has with his disciples, on the night when he is betrayed, on a night when a table is spread before him, he begins to talk a little bit about, you know, you're like branches and I'm the vine. And if you minnow, Abide in me, stay put in me, camp out in me, and I abide, stay put, camp out, pitch my tent in you, then you will bear much fruit. And in the midst of talking that way, they ask him a question again at the end of their time together. And this time the question is not where are you staying because now by now they know where he's staying. The question is, where are you going? And he says, going to a place where you cannot go right now. Do not be afraid, but your hearts not be troubled. Neither let them be afraid for I am going to prepare a place for you. You know what the word is there that's used for place? The root of it is minnow. I'm going to prepare a remaining place for you, a place where you can stay put with me forever and forever. Amen. But it requires more than talking about things. It requires more than thinking about things. It requires coming and seeing. And he looks and he finds that there is bread and there is a cup. And he does the most interesting thing. He gives them a memory tool so they would never forget and that you and I would never forget that faith requires tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. It requires coming to the table and walking away from every other table that leaves us hungry still. So when we come to this table today, that's exactly what we're doing. We are literally practicing an act of faith because I don't have to come. I can stay where I am. I can think about faith and talk about faith and pontificate about the possibilities of faith, but But until I come, 
and see for myself and risk everything that I'm leaving behind, I will never truly know that he is good. And that's why even now, we have deacons and other leaders of the church who are moving into positions to offer you a taste of the bread and the cup. And as they're moving to their places, I want you to know what we're doing and why we're doing it. We're gonna come to the table as an act of faith, but as we come, you will be invited after I offer a word of prayer to exit your row to your right and walk forward. And one of our servants will hand you a piece of bread that you will take and then dip the very edge of it into the cup. It's called intinction. And then you take it and you eat it, being reminded, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Being reminded that I can taste and see that the Lord who was far off has become so close that I have now consumed his love. But after you take and eat, you simply walk back to your your seat and enter your row from the left side and sit and remain in worship as others are served. Remember that as you come forward to the bread and cup, they will hand you bread, but a word of courtesy, no double dipping. And a reminder, if you drop it, let it go. We have another. And... If you have gluten sensibilities, there's a place for you too. We have gluten-free options. You just let them know, and we'll give you one of those as well. Now, in the balcony, it's just like an airplane. Sometimes the exit you're looking for is behind you. And so you'll exit in the same way, and the marshals will help you find your way to the table. And if you cannot move because of mobility issues, we have those who are watching and will come and offer this to you should you so desire, they'll come to you. Now, the reason we do this today in this way is to demonstrate our faith. And I want you, as you participate, to make your walk a prayer. God, I am coming forward, not simply because this is a rote ritual and I've been told to do it. I'm coming forward because I want, in a small way, to demonstrate to you that when you say, come and see, then here I am. I am coming. Open my eyes. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, for the unspeakable gift of your Son, O Christ, for the unfathomable gift of your life, Holy Spirit, for the ineffable mystery of your presence among us. We say thank you. And we pray now that you would bless this bread and bless this cup as we take and eat and are reminded that you have set this table for the imperfect, for the broken, for the unfinished. We pray that those who are hungry And those who are thirsty for you would be filled. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So, on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord took a loaf of bread and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said this, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this. And remember me. Likewise, he took a cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, the new arrangement, the new way to abide, stay put, remain in me and I in you. As often as you drink it, remember me. Let all those who are hungry and thirsty for the Christ of God come to the table.
Let the family of God say amen. It has been good to worship together today, my sisters and brothers. We come now to the most important part of our worship gathering. That moment when we make a decision to leave this place, scatter into a world longing for the bread and cup of grace. Our pastors at this time are making their way to the front of each worship venue in the sanctuary as well as in the Family Life Center. And we're here and we'll remain here, abide here, pitch a tent here, so that after the benediction, you have the opportunity to talk to any one of us about anything that you need. It may be that today you have felt a stirring in your heart to give your life to Jesus Christ for the first time ever. Maybe just now it makes sense to you to yield, surrender your life to him. Well, we want to take our time and talk to you about that. So after the benediction, you come and talk to to one of us. There will be two of us here and two in the Family Life Center. It may be that you've given your life to Christ, but you've been looking for a church family to be a part of, a place where you can be unfinished and imperfect and it be okay because God's working on all of us. Maybe you want to join the church today, become a member and call Johns Creek Baptist Church your church family. You let us know today and we'll stay and show you what that looks like and talk to you about your next steps. But for now, having been fully fed by the table of grace, it's time for us to scatter and to live outside these walls as if we actually believe everything that we've affirmed inside these walls. So as you're able, stand to your feet for the benediction. And wherever you go, may Christ go before you to prepare your way. May Christ go behind you in the days that you fear and feel like retreating to encourage you one step further at a time. May Christ go to your right and Christ to your left, abiding, remaining, staying closer than even a a sister or brother. May Christ go above you in the days when dark clouds roll in, and they will, to remind you there is one above the clouds who at the end of the day has the final word. May Christ go beneath you, girding you with confidence and removing all forms of fear. But mostly may Christ go in you, transforming you from the inside out until your hearts beat in rhythm with his. Amen.
this one week that uh, Herndon couldn't come and the, the third guy is gone. He also saw a star. Then there's, uh, but we, I know we need to do a couple of things. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you guys a couple days. 